an ancient message written on stone and then buried in a mound in Tennessee. Discovered by the Smithsonian over a century ago, it has collected dust in the archives. It was found near the Back Creek, just south of Knoxville, inscribed with Paleo-Hebrew letters dating to biblical times of Solomon. When it was discovered, it was said to be the writing of the Cherokee Indians. Later, researchers at the Smithsonian identified it as Semitic. As you can see from this example of the Cherokee alphabet, it has no relation. This is a form of Paleo-Hebrew with possible Phoenician or Greek influence, dating it to the time of King Solomon's reign or just after his empire fell. As you can see, when the known letters are superimposed onto the stone's letters, they are slightly different. This makes translations of some ancient symbols subjective because they did not use a standard font. Writing was reflective of the particular person who wrote or carved it, and that makes it difficult to make a definitive statement about the true meaning. These types of artifacts are mysterious and avoided because they dispute the known historical record. This is a thought-provoking concept because of the effect a change in history would have on the mindset of mankind. In psychology, this is called the a priori effect. We consulted psychologist Dr. Howard Budden to explain further. My name is Dr. Howard Button. I have a PhD in clinical psychology and I'm currently doing a fellowship for specialization in neuropsychology. A priori effect is something that is, is uh, specific to fields of social psychology and philosophy and it's one of a few different theories that uh, helps to explain or discuss what happens when people are faced with new information that is uh, orthogonal or somehow in contrast to what they've known and held to believe for a long time. And, uh, and, and this can be anything. It can be a uh, moral judgment. Um, it can be a, a hard and cold fact. So, uh, for example, if you were to find out all of a sudden that aliens did in fact exist, uh, the extraterrestrials, uh, you know, had been coming here for however long or whatever, and you'd been told your entire life that uh, that was not the case. Um, this, the a priori, a priori theory would help to explain some of that. And it says that um, basically your judgment a priori is, will be adjusted after you receive this new knowledge that uh, it'll be adjusted in some way that will allow you to fit this new scheme of this new information. This is an area of archaeology that many scientists do not dare explore for fear of being ostracized, or worse, reprisal by institutions that have long argued that diffusionism or the widespread interaction of cultures did not exist. Smithsonian researchers in the 1960s translated it as for Judea, or for the Judeans. We consulted Paleo-Hebrew expert Eric Bissler to have him examine the stone, and he explained that it might have a slightly expanded meaning which could link the find to stories of the Bible. So we're looking at this stone, which is called the Bat Creek Stone. Hebrew is read right to left. So there's two letters on the right, comma, then there's five letters. There's another symbol or what looks like it might be a letter underneath the line. And then there's a broken fragment of a letter to the extreme left. This could mean to awaken or come to the end of something regarding Yahud. So the pictographs in Hebrew have to do with images embedded within the orthographs of the letter shapes themselves. There are, there are these iconic glyphs. And it goes back to where the scriptural use of that word, Kuzadi, would be in Daniel 12, 4, a Bible where it says, where the angel Gabriel says, Daniel, hide the words and seal the book until the time of the end. And there's one train of thought says that the ancient Mayans, or ancient uh, people that became 
known as the Incas or the, even the Aztecs, perhaps, the uh, South American, may have also been uh, the remnants of Phoenician mining camps in South America. For example, just the word Brazil means iron in Hebrew, and Brazil even to this day mines iron. Uh, there's evidence that the Phoenician era people were mining copper from the Great Lakes region of the United States, even. So, if there was people mining in approximately 1000 BC, and then when Solomon's empire was handed over to Rehoboam, and then to Jeroboam, and there was a civil war, and it is associated, and the various mining uh, communities in this, you might say, the New World were left because their link to the Old World were cut. Those same people that were in the various mining camps may have become the various, what we call indigenous people of South and North America. It could be telling them to take up and regard the matters of the original instructions, biblically speaking, from the covenant to the, to the forefathers, similar to the Ameri North American indigenous Indian peoples concept of returning back to the ancient past. The letter M is a prefix of another word generally means to be from or away from or contrary to it's, it's someone or a place concerning a matter. Kuf, especially drawn in a different way, can be seen as a shackle. And the letter Zadi sometimes is drawn as a fish hook. And if you have a fish hook and a shackle, those can be seen as weapons of captivity. On the other hand, the Zadi being a fish hook can also mean that which opens. And the word that's spelled pay Zadi literally means open mouth. So Kuf Zadi can mean like the opening of the shackle, the opening of the capturing, which is to say the release, the end of something regarding these people's matter. So whether this was something that somebody else wrote about them, or whether this was something that one of their own people wrote to them, say, hey, let's wake up, you guys. So I would say that it has to do, because it's written in Hebrew, even though it looks like a Phoenician script, it's known as Paleo-Hebrew or Ancient Hebrew, it can be seen also as this ornamentation, like putting a necklace of adornment on somebody. And a Zadi can be a picture of a resurrection, like a butterfly climbing out of a chrysalis. And this could be a warning or a reminder to Yehuda to take hope that there's a promise by terms of the covenant that in the future there is this re-emergence, a resurgence, a reawakening that the Almighty promised to the forefathers of Israel, of Yehuda, that if they would come back to the terms of the covenant, the terms of the covenant would be restored to them and the preeminence on the world scene would be given to them, which is what brought them to the new world to begin with, because it was about 1000 BC of the era of Kings David and Solomon, where they were militarily superior, David basically conquered all his surrounding adversaries and his kingdom later became known as the Phoenician kingdom, losing its identity with that of Israel and being thought of as Lebanese merchants rather than as the Hebrew, Israelite, Judean empire that it actually was a few years before. To address this first word spelled Kutz, Kuf Zari, so something comes to an end, it could also be not necessarily an end, but a change. Like when you're going down a road and you turn left, you're no longer going straight down one road, now you're going down another road. It just means you just rounded a corner or changed a direction or changed a course. To start with that extreme left letter, there's only, there's a sharp point. There's no way to know whether that's a letter part of the bigger word or whether it's a suffix or whether it's some other type of word but only 
the letter MIM, our letter in English M, has a point like that. It could be that the author who wrote this was remembering meanings of letters, and back in the ancient days, there was not necessarily a standardized script shape, which is why you'll see a number of different variations throughout different artifacts. Some have Greek influence, some had Canaanite or perhaps even Egyptian or Canaan influence, but if you know what the letters mean when you're looking at them, it's a subjective determination. Sometimes, like in the uh, ancient uh, Leviticus scroll that they found in Qumran, they had a dot between words. Here there's a comma, so that could mean this is a word. There's no letter right next to the first two letters on the right, so that could be a standalone word. Now you have what looks like the letter Lamed, which as a prefix means unto, or it means by, or it means regarding. It's a prefix letter. And then you have a Yod, A, and then something that looks kind of like an, the letter F, which is actually the letter Vav. There was actually a few different ways to draw that letter, but that's a pretty standard one right there. So it's Lamed yod he vav or la ya Then this three-lined letter to the left could be a Dalit or it could be a Resh. The problem is a Resh was pretty much drawn with a curved shape similar to a backwards appearance of the first letter that, that's the coup. So this might be a Dalit because a Dalit was drawn as a triangle. And I've seen uh, figures where the Dalit was rotated different directions. It's very similar to the Greek delta. This doesn't connect as the whole triangle. It looks like it's two intersecting lines of the fragmented line. And then you have to say, well, maybe that was just this author's penmanship. Uh, the letter A that looks like a backwards E also sometimes was drawn vertical, and this one's, you might say, expressing itself horizontal. Sometimes it had a longer tail. So if this was a yod heh vav Dalit, that would say Yahud. Now the tribe of Judah, known as Yahudah, would have been a yod heh vav Dalit A. But that letter that looks like a point, which might be a mem, isn't a he. So this could say Lamed is a prefix then for Yahud, which might mean or Yahud, Yahuda, but that would have been the southern kingdom of, known as Yehuda. Carbon dating of the wood fragments dated the stone between 32 AD and 769 AD, according to Professor McCulloch of Ohio State University. We attempted to contact Ohio State University for confirmation and did not receive a response. However, the style of the letters do date it to that period. A stone like this provokes questions about history giving possible evidence to a civilization much older in North America with a possible biblical connection or older. The translation indicates that it could reference the people of the southern kingdom of Israel. The discovery of the lost Luna stone in New Mexico with Paleo-Hebrew writing of the Ten Commandments and other evidence of ancient cultures in North America suggests there is a forgotten part of the North American history. Folklore from the Cherokee Indians speaks of their culture being descended from a much older civilization from which they learned the art of writing. In the area of Tennessee, there is evidence of a race of people called the Melungians, who were not Native American, but ancestors of the Cherokee Indians. The Melungians claimed they were descendants of Phoenician sailors or refugees from the Arab world. The word Mayan Chan and Mayan Jun are Arabic Moorish words meaning accursed souls. They were thought to have arrived to America via trade vessels and were chronicled by early explorers. Many fraudulent artifacts have fueled the controversy over the interaction between North American cultures and others throughout the world, which has clouded the truth of our history. This series explores all aspects of these out-of-place artifacts in an attempt to inspire people to find out what they believe and why they believe it. Join me on my adventure to explore the mysteries of the unknown. The discovery of these artifacts worldwide challenges us to understand the truth of our past for the future of humankind. The greatest thing in life is there are so many possibilities. I will keep searching for clues until next time. 
Check hiddenarchaeology.com for the latest.